Humor in the Bible, Part 1, Introducing Saul. We meet Saul in 1 Samuel, Chapter 9. There was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bechorath, son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. We just know that this guy is going to be something special. He's got a genealogy as long as your arm, and rich too. And that's when the author springs his first surprise. Verse 2 reads, he had a son whose name was Saul. Oh, it's not about this guy, it's about his son Saul. Saul must be even more special to have a dad like that. Whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. He stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Wow! Now this guy's a real hero. Pedigree as long as your arm. Rich, Dad. Handsome. The most handsome guy around. And he's tall, too. Head and shoulders above everyone else. Phew! You know, you can't get into hero school unless you're tall and handsome, and probably well-muscled, too. Well, Saul would have no trouble getting in. And that's where we get our second surprise. You see, the book up to this point has been slowly but surely steadily building up the picture that Israel needs a king, Israel wants a king, and Israel, by golly, is going to get a king. And now we've been introduced to this tall, handsome Saul. Verse 3. Now, the donkeys of Kish. Donkeys? OK, donkeys are important to peasant farmers. But to kings? Now, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, had strayed. So Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the boys with you and go and look for the donkeys. A simple enough request, you'd think. He passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shalishah, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Sha'alim, but they were not there. Then he passed through the land of Benjamin, but they did not find them. Hey, what's going on? How come this tall, handsome stud can't find a few missing donkeys? And what's with all these places? Where the heck is Shalisha? There's no Shalisha on any sensible map I've ever seen. And what about Sha'alaim? Look them up in a Bible dictionary and see what you find. Intelligent guesses. We don't know where they were. They're not real places. Their names are there to draw our attention to the fact that Saul has been shilly-shallying around all over the countryside. Shilly-shallying to a Shalisha. Shilly-shallying to Sha'alaim. Everything but finding donkeys. Now, despite the shilly-shallying, our Saul's not totally thick. So, verse 5, when they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to the boy who was with him, Let's turn back, or my father will stop worrying about the donkeys and worry about us. Yeah, I expect so. I mean, if I'd sent my son out to look for the cat, I wouldn't expect him to go wandering around for days on end. But he said to him, That presumably is the, the boy, because biblical authors quite often fail to identify too clearly who's speaking and all, amid all the he's. So, verse 6, he said to him, There's a man of God in this town. He's a man held in honour. Whatever he says always comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us about the journey upon which we have set out. Cool, that's better. After all that nonsense with the donkeys, at last we're back to the hero stuff. A man of God who always tells the truth, predicts the future, and who will tell them about their quest. Yeah, this is hero stuff. You see what's going on? This story is being told to us in ways which don't cause us to take it entirely seriously. If you can read this stuff without a smile, then there's something wrong with you. However, just when we think we're back in hero school, Saul replied to the boy, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there's no present to bring the man of God. What have we? Oh, you thick o Saul! You haven't come out without any money again. The boy answered Saul again. Here, I have with me a quarter shekel of silver. You see, the boy is one of these typical servants who are brighter than their master and better equipped than their master and more ready than their master, but still a servant. This anonymous boy is a sort of Sancho Panza to Saul's Don Quixote. 
Here, I have with me a quarter shekel of silver. I'll give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Now, is it just me, or do I get the sense that this boy wants to get home, and is afraid that Saul will have him shilly-shallying around the countryside for another week or two? At this point, the narrator inserts a little note, which calms things down for a moment and stops our guffaws of laughter. Formerly in Israel, anyone who went to inquire of God would say, Come, let's go to the seer. For the one who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. That's sensible enough footnote. And it does no harm to have the odd sensible footnote in a story as full of laughter as this one. Saul said to the boy, Come, let's go. Saul is a thoroughly eloquent young man, as you can see, full of long and complicated words and well-crafted phrases. Saul said to the boy, Good, come, let's go. So they went to the town where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water and said to them, now here I need to insert a, a serious scholarly footnote. You'll have noticed if you read the Bible much that uh, when a man on a journey goes to a well and meets some girls, then there's a marriage in the offing. So, as we hear this about Saul meeting the girls going to draw water, our ears prick up and we are saying, Aha! The hero's going to get married. We're going to have a fair princess to add to the story and enrich it. They met some girls coming out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? They answered, Yes, there he is just ahead of you. Hurry, he's just come just now to the town, because the people are having a sacrifice today at the shrine. As soon as you enter the town, you'll find him, before he goes up to the shrine to eat, for the people will not eat until he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterwards, those eat who are invited. Now go up, you'll meet him immediately. Wow. Read that again slowly. Well, actually, it wouldn't be a bad idea to read it again slowly, because if you do, what you'll notice is that the girls are babbling. What they're saying is sensible enough, but it's strung together in ways that make it seem almost like nonsense. Oh, yeah, that's a real surprise. Here are these girls faced with a handsome stranger, the most handsome man in all the land, who is, on top of that, head and shoulders taller than any other guy they've ever seen. It's no wonder they're babbling. And they're going they're meeting him on their way to the well. Their minds too have begun to turn to thoughts of romance and marriage. But notice too the other thing about the words they're saying. How many times did they underline that if Saul will just poke his nose inside the gate of the town, he's going to meet the man of God? Yes, there he is just ahead of you. One hurry to he's come just now to the town because the people have a sacrifice today at the shrine maybe three as soon as you enter the town you'll find him four before he goes up to the shrine to eat maybe for the people will not eat until he comes oh yes it was because that means he's in a hurry because he's got a whole crowd of hungry people waiting for him since he must bless the sacrifice afterwards those eat who are invited that just underlines that bit now go up, for you will meet him immediately. That's about five or six. So, you should have got the message that as soon as Saul pokes his nose inside the town gate, he's going to meet the man of God. Verse 14. So they went up to the town. As they were entering the town, aha, they saw Samuel coming out towards them on his way to the shrine. Now, and here there's another little excursus as the... Um, Narrator drops back a day and gives us a flashback. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be ruler over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen the suffering of my people, because their outcry has come to me. Ah, we're back in history stuff now. This is the stuff that kings are made of. God set it all up in advance. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall rule over my people. Then Saul approached Samuel inside the gate and said, uh, Tell me, please, where is the house of the seer? Uh? Saul, 
The girls babbled on for five minutes, telling you you'd meet the seer as soon as you poked your nose inside the gate of the city. Everyone else has gone out to the feast. They're all there waiting, every single one of them. Just the girls were left. And you meet a man, a fairly distinguished elderly man, coming out of the city. Haven't you any idea who it is? Tell me, please, where is the house of the seer? This story is told in ways which just can't help but make you laugh. Chuckle or fall down laughing, that's up to you. But laugh, you have to. And at the moment, we're not too sure why we're laughing. That is to say, we're not too sure why the author has got us laughing. Because the point of it seems at this stage to be purely for the aesthetic pleasure of it. But the Bible very seldom does things purely for aesthetic pleasure. As we read on further in the story of the rise of kingship in Israel, we'll discover why we're laughing at Saul the buffoon, the guy who was head and shoulders taller than everyone else and the most handsome man in the land. It's because one of the threads that's going to run through this story from beginning to end is that God doesn't see things the same way we do. Think of the not-so-funny story of the seer Samuel going to anoint David as Saul's successor, and of Jesse, the father, parading his sons one after the other in front of Samuel, who looks at them and thinks, Coo, yes, this one will do. And God says, no, not him. God does not see things the same way we do.